Welcome to episode 2072. And today, what we are going to talk about is absolutely huge. It is game changing for the real estate industry. Well, I should say potentially, because it's never over till it's over. But a very big case that I have mentioned it before was just decided literally yesterday. This is a case that involves accusations that many big players in the real estate industry were a cartel, that they are price fixing, that they are violating antitrust laws and conspiring to raise the cost of transacting real estate and profit from limiting choices for consumers. And you know, stay till the end because my opinion on this may surprise you. I spent half of my career in the traditional real estate industry. One of the big parties in this case settled out before the case was decided for $56 million. And I thought, and many people in the industry thought they were crazy, but it turns out that they were pretty smart and that is Remax. So we're going to take a look at the multi-dimensional nature of this case, how it affects you, how it affects the industry as a whole, what it means for the future of real estate, real estate prices will be impacted by this. The whole inner workings and outer workings of the real estate industry could be changed dramatically. When I say this, this is not clickbait. This is not hype. This is a big, big deal. So let's go into it. Well, some of the headlines include this one, an earthquake just hit the real estate industry as class action ruling comes down. The only question is, a big or a small quake. The National Association of Realtors, their chief legal officer said, quote, this will have major consequences on the real estate industry and the profession for years to come. Now, National Association of Realtors, why are they important? Well, I am not a member of NAR, but I was for half of my career. I was required to be a member of NAR for half of my career. And in about 2005, when I sold my traditional real estate company to Coldwell Banker, I did not continue as a member of NAR, but I could have. And, you know, there's good reason to say that maybe they are a cartel. We will get into that and kind of examine both sides of that. Okay, let's keep going here with some of the headlines. So I tweeted this yesterday or Exit, I guess you could say. A Missouri jury finds NAR and several big brokerages guilty of conspiring to inflate commissions. After two weeks of testimony, the Kansas City jury found NAR, Home Services, and Keller Williams guilty of collusion to keep commissions high. Now, probably most people listening in the public, if you're not in the industry, you probably think commissions are too high. And I don't disagree with you. I think the commissions really are too high just because of the way the industry evolved. But I'm also going to tell you about why I think the commissions have to be high because this industry is so dysfunctional. It's a dis functional industry. And I'm going to propose to you in this video some possible solutions for uh, making it less dysfunctional. So this is other breaking news, breaking new lawsuits filed against Compass, EXP World Holdings, Redfin, Weicker, United Real Estate, Howard Hanna, Douglas Elliman. We had, we had the president of Douglas Elliman on the show before, and she talked about a lot of things that were going on in the industry during the COVID era. The suit names the National Association of Realtors as a defendant. So immediately after this verdict came down, a whole bunch of other lawsuits were filed. And there are going to be many more. This could easily, I could easily see this in a few years at the Supreme Court of the United States, changing the real estate industry possibly forever. The, the significance of this case cannot be understated. It is a very, very big deal. Okay, so what happened? Well, you know, this federal jury in Kansas City found that NAR, the National Association of Realtors, which, by the way, is the largest or one of the largest trade lobbying organizations in the entire world with, I think, about 1.6 million members now. And some of these largest brokerages, they said they 
have colluded and they find them $1.78 billion. And this is not just $1.78 billion. Now, you may be familiar with a big case that I won just over a year ago. Myself and two of my companies won this case in federal court in Fort Lauderdale. You can look it up against a competitor that was trying to badmouth me and writing all kinds of falsities uh, on the internet, spreading them about me to try and gain market share. And the jury, in my case, found them liable for civil RICO, racketeering, conspiring against me. And, you know, they were doing this. And what does that mean? When there is a RICO case, they are basically liable for treble damages. And this case was not like that, but it's similar in the sense that because there are antitrust issues involved and anti-competitive issues involved, these damages are treble, just like my RICO case. So in my case, myself and two of my companies were awarded originally about $56 million dollars not nearly as big as this NAR case, but I did an entire YouTube video on that, an entire podcast episode on that. So if you're interested in this fascinating case that happened to me, I litigated this case for, you know, for four or five years. Check that out for more detail on that. But I have some pretty deep knowledge as to how this stuff works because I was involved in a somewhat similar case. You know, there is one thing that could just massively disrupt the real estate industry, and it's not this case specifically, but it's what might come out of this case. And I'm going to tell you at the end, this could have huge financial impact on you, uh, your real estate, your life. I mean, it's just such a big deal. But this case really is not a $1.8 billion case. It's over $5 billion because of this trouble damages issue. Okay, so here is an interesting video from CNBC. Let's just listen to a couple clips of this. This is the lawyer that won the case and a real estate person arguing with him about the case. So let's just take a look at this for a moment. All right, so what does the ruling mean for the industry at large and maybe what you pay for a home? Where do we go from here? Joining us now on set is Bess Friedman. She is the CEO of Brown Harris Stevens and a member of the National Association of Realtors and Michael Ketchmark, the lead attorney of that lawsuit representing 500,000 homeowners in Missouri. Bess and Michael, thank you for joining us. So why is he representing 500,000 homeowners in Missouri? Well, because they achieved getting class action status. The court awarded them class action status. So this represented just these people in Missouri, but this will now become a national issue. Remember, you know, the, the, amount of transactions every year in the United States are four, you know, approximately four to six million transactions. So this is ginormous. This case is so big and it's so wide reaching. It's here. Uh, first to you, uh, Michael, what, what, what is big settlement here? 1.8 or verdict, I should say, $1.8 billion. First up, where does that money go? Is, is money going to be kicked back to people who bought homes or where? Sure. I mean, we view it as a day of accountability. And I told the jury, this case is simple. It comes down to premises. I learned when I was in kindergarten. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, you give it back. The money will be returned to the homeowners. Well, that's not really true, as we know, because the lawyers will get most of the money. <laughs> so, you know, let's see how much the homeowners actually get. Maybe they'll get a free, like, cell phone charger or a Starbucks gift card. You know, like, that's that's the way this stuff really works in real life, sadly, because the legal system is a complete epic scam but that's another discussion for another day there were the victims of this rigged system it's been going on in our country for about 100 years and it stops today and, and we're going to hold these um th these corporate real estate companies and national association of realtors accountable for their conduct and i understand you are ready or have already filed more lawsuits yeah the day that the, the minute that that verdict was was came in we we filed the lawsuit against the national association of realtors and these other large corporate real estate companies to bring the same relief nationwide and we expect the damages damages in those cases to be in excess of 100 billion dollars and look, so think about that 100 billion dollars it's impossible for the real estate industry to win this 
Okay, I mean, think about it. Now, obviously, it's going to be appealed. That will take years to work its way through the system. But maybe the total value of all these real estate companies is like, I don't know, $40, $50 billion or something. There's no way they could pay this, right? If there's a $100 billion award, it's just impossible to pay. We are wasting right now about $50 billion a year in wealth that's being taken out of the pockets of homeowners and transferred over to these corporate machines that have taken over real estate. And it's got to stop. Corporate the national see, see, that's the thing that's interesting about this. You know, the money they sued for and then, you know, won, it's not in the hands of the brokerages, really. Most of that ends up in the hands of the individual real estate agents. Look, I owned a traditional real estate brokerage for eight years. And let me tell you something, I made way more money as a salesperson for Remax. I was one of the top Remax agents in the entire world. I worked there for 12 years, right? And I did extremely well. And I always thought, well, you know, I want to own the brokerage to move up the ladder, right? And I did do that. But I came to find that being a top agent is much more lucrative than being an owner of a brokerage. Because, you know, the, the brokerage gets a smaller portion of that commission of that pie. So most of this money has already been transferred to the agents, right? NAR, you're going to hear him talk about how much they receive in dues. It's just not even that much really compared. I mean, it's a lot, of course, because it's a huge organization, but compared to the amount of money at stake here, it's it's really not that much. So let's listen. Association of Realtors takes in almost a quarter of a billion dollars in fees. Quarter of a billion dollars in fees every year, right? So, you know, then they spend that on lobbyists and they lobby Congress, right? From local real estate agents because they have a stranglehold on the market. And, and that's okay, Michael, but, but that's, that, that's, that's the NA, he's talking about the NAR, National Associate Realtors, right. which you are a member. Yep. But you know, cor are you a corporate machine? No, we are not. And I can't comment on the lawsuit because it was in Missouri. So I'm well, not of course she could that, comment on it. What I can say I mean, is that the majority of all real estate transactions are done with two agents, a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. And what is being said, I think, is completely untrue. It takes away from the fact that the buyer's agent adds incredible value to the transaction. Okay, so she's absolutely right about that. What's at issue here is, you know, when you list a property for sale, right, it goes into the multiple listing service because National Association of Realtors, when you're a member, you are required to cooperate with other real estate agents, other realtor members. And that's actually a good thing. I mean, our system in the U.S. is dramatically better than it is in other countries. It is so much better for the consumer that you have access to the full market. Look, I got back from Brazil a couple of weeks ago, and that was my 92nd country. I've now visited personally 92 countries, and I have spent just days and days and days, maybe weeks, looking at real estate in these countries. Okay, I have gone around with brokers, real estate agents, I have met with attorneys, title companies, lenders, banks, in many of these countries, probably more than half of them that I visited. Look, folks, I never stop working. I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. I love this business. I love real estate investing. So, you know, I can tell you that it is really difficult to look for properties in other countries versus the United States. Because we evolved to have this multiple listing service and this cooperation, it is much better for the consumer, but it's not all good. There are some definite downsides because you know if you've done a real estate transaction that it goes something like this, right? You list your property. The realtors used to all try to charge 6%. You know, that's come down over the years to maybe, you know, maybe now they try to get 5%. Of course, it's not fixed by law. That's the basis of this whole discussion, this whole lawsuit. It is negotiable, but you know, how negotiable is it really, okay? I mean, I object to, you know, them saying the, the realtors are a cartel because I have been to many real estate meetings and seminars and conferences. And I have never, ever in my very long career heard anybody say, you know, we need to charge this much money, right? That's just never happened. In fact, anytime someone even broaches that subject, they always make the disclaimer, commissions are not fixed. We can't have this discussion about commissions, right? We can't even discuss it. And, you know, it's just a very dangerous area to discuss. But somehow, 
I don't think they do that, right? Even though somehow, you know, there seems to be this thing of like, if you can negotiate that the listing agent will take, you know, one and a half percent, for example, right? Instead of 3%, which they're trying to get, or maybe you get them down to 1%, right? Redfin is a discount brokerage. They're kind of pushing the pressure down on these commissions. Okay, great. Somehow, though, the buyer's agent through the MLS, through the way the cooperation works, you know, it used to be that like they wouldn't even show your property unless you paid them 3%, right? And then it became like two to two and a half percent. Okay. And look, these are not fixed. They are totally negotiable. But I tell you, as a seller, whenever I sell a property, I don't know. I personally, as a client of the industry, right? Not as a person who holds a license and is in the business. I don't think I can get these buyer's agents to show my property unless I'm paying less than a competitive rate, right? Which the other people are paying. So that's how I think it does sort of like there's this like implicit thing that you've got to pay that much or your house is just going to get kind of blackballed, right? But compared to what? right? What is it like in the other systems in other countries, right? You know, there you go to one broker and they're going to show you the properties they have. And you're not even going to see another 90% of the market, which are the properties all the other brokers have. And you're going to just not be exposed to the market. So I do think our system is much better here. Now, what we might see is we might see where listing agents go and list a property on a platform. And I think this is going to be a lot better for the platforms. I think yesterday, even though I'm going to show you the stock and how the stocks of various players in the industry reacted, whether it be Zillow, Redfin, et cetera, Remax, et cetera, right? But what's interesting is this is a win, in my opinion, for the platforms. The big tech companies just made a fortune yesterday with this verdict, because now what can happen is people can go list their properties on Zillow or, you know, Redfin's considered a platform and their stock was hit hard. But I think this is actually probably a win for them. Ultimately, we'll, we'll see. I don't, it's very hard to know how this is going to play out, right? It's just too early to tell, T-E-T-T. -T -T. But these platforms now people can go put their property on them and the consumers are going to go direct more often than not. They're going to go direct and they're going to go to Zillow and they're going to see lots of properties now with no commission being offered to the buyer's agent or the buyer's broker. And now if someone wants help and they're buying a property, they're going to need to hire a buyer's broker directly and pay them directly. So, you know, usually they can't afford to pay them because that commission for the buyer's agent is sort of built into the price of the property and the seller pays it. And that's the traditional way it's been for the last hundred years. Okay, fine. Well, now what happens? I'm going to talk to you at the end about the huge market disruptor. This is the thing that is the game changer. And I just want to say, I don't really have a dog in this race. You know, I'm not in the traditional real estate industry. I don't think this affects my business in any hugely significant way. I don't know. It may. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it will. But I, it's kind of hard for me to see that at this point. Um, but, you know, we will see. It's again, it's too early to tell. Let's keep listening. And so I think the narrative out there, the Wall Street Journal had an article where they referred to NAR as a cartel. It's ridiculous. And I think there's hardworking agents who are out there representing buyers every day. And this totally takes away from that. And I think it's unfortunate. It's the wrong narrative because we work together. Yeah. And I'm going to give her credit for that. I don't think NAR is a cartel. You know, listen, I'm not an NAR member. I don't even really like NAR very much. I, I think they're sort of like this stodgy, old fashioned organization. And I don't like the fact that to you know, be in the real estate business, you basically are forced to become a member of NAR. It's like you have to join a union, you know, to get a job. It's stupid. I, I much prefer a right to work state, right? I don't like these states where you have to join a union to get a job as an auto worker or, or a whatever, right? Why, why should you have to do that? I'm a, I'm a free trade guy, libertarian thinker. I don't think NAR has ever told anybody to fix their commissions or anything like that. I'd, I'd like to see the evidence that was presented to this jury because I have never seen that in all my years of doing this. 
together. It's cooperation. You get the best price when everybody works together. And I'm sure right about those that people too. That obviously you're selling a home, you'd like to pay as little as you could. I mean, everybody wants to pay as little as they can for everything across whatever the asset class is. That's for right. most people, including myself, I will never buy anything more expensive than my home. This is the most important and complex yeah, financial right. transaction that most of us will that's ever, right. ever go through. That's right. And that's why, you know, you, you have someone, if you're selling your home, you hire someone to represent you. They're your fiduciary. And also buyers want somebody to represent them, to talk to them about the pros and the cons, the neighborhood, you know, their financing, everything. No. So you want to have two people. Yeah, see, a lot of this now, if buyer's agents are basically out where like they can't be paid through the MLS and the, you know, and I think it's going to put downward pressure on their commissions. And I also think it's going to lead to more business for attorneys to do real estate transactions and settlements. But the problem is the attorney doesn't know anything about the neighborhood or the house or the construction quality or anything like that. You know, they just know how to do the paperwork. So that's not going to be good for people. That's not going to be good for the public. It's not going to be good for consumers. People, just like you would in a divorce, you want to have two people on the side of the transaction. It's the well, same. hopefully this is more of a marriage than a divorce. <laughs> but it can be a divorce. You know? so, so, Michael, yeah, is your the beef says, with yeah. the, 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 the NAR? Is it with the compensation structure? Do you think that, and we've talked before, that there shouldn't be a buyer's agent, or if they do, the buyer's agent should not be paid by the seller because that may be the conflict, and maybe if you're a buyer, you actually pay your buyer's right. agent. We got nothing against buyer's agents. I think they're awesome. But who the person they should pay for is the person they're working for. What this member of the National Association of Realtors, she just gave away the case. She said, you have competitors who are working together. They're colluding together to fix the prices at 6%. I mean, that. that's what's happening. That's what the jury heard two weeks of evidence of. We revealed the documents. We revealed the videotapes. We revealed all of the emails. And, and the, the CEO of, of the NAR testified at trial and took the stand, and we exposed him for what he is. It is a cartel. It's a cartel. It is that not is a cartel. I really take offense at that. It is not a cartel. It, well, I'm, I'm sure you do and i take offense at the yeah that's ridiculous i don't think it's a cartel okay but somehow these commissions are really really high and i actually think they're too high okay now i know i'm gonna get a lot of hate from my colleagues in the industry about that but uh, the reason they're too high let me tell you why they're too high okay they have to be too high because the real estate industry there are so many people in it think about it we have four to six million transactions approximately every year. And we got 1.5 million, give or take, members of National Association of Realtors, right? And, you know, there are more people with a license who aren't a member of the association, understand that. But let's just look at the members of NAR, the people that are members of MLS services, they have lockbox keys, those are the people selling houses, the vast majority, okay? So they've got, you know, maybe four transactions per year each in order to split that up, to split up that pie. And this is the problem. There's so little barrier to entry to enter our business. And there are so many, and I, when I say our business, it's really not my business anymore. I'm not in the traditional real estate business. So again, I'm kind of detached from this whole thing, right? But it, it, you know, since I spent half my career in it, I know a lot about it. They're competing for such a small pie that instead of practicing their trade, they have to spend all this time and money marketing to get business. And the stakes are so high because each commission is too high. You heard me say that. I think the commissions are too high, especially on high-end homes, right? Like why should a real estate agent get 60 to $120,000 for transacting a $2 million deal? That is absurd. It's absurd. But Who's paying for all those glossy brochures and those mailers and those websites and those Facebook ads and all of that stuff? That's where the money really goes. It goes to printers, big tech companies. It go, it, that's where it all goes, okay? Look, when I trained realtors, for many years I trained realtors, and not just the ones in my own office where I owned a company, but I trained them, you know, I would be a speaker, just like I am now, but I train real estate industry people on how to be successful selling real estate. You know what I would say to them? I would say, for your first few years in the business, you need to plan to spend 50%, half of your income on marketing and advertising. And once you get established and you have momentum, you need to spend about 33% of your income on advertising. And I used to say to them, instead of having a goal as to how much money you want to make, 
don't put the cart before the horse. You know, it's like standing in front of the empty fireplace and saying, give me heat and then I'll put in some wood. Put in the wood first. And if your goal is to make $200,000, how are you gonna spend $100,000? That's what I would say to them, right? And this is dysfunctional. It should not be this way. They should not be spending all this money on marketing and all this time on marketing. That's mostly what the business has become. But this isn't just real estate that's like this. Most industries are like this. Your chiropractor, a lawyer, a dentist, you know, you're spending all this time and effort on marketing to bring in new business so you can basically overcharge them. This is the way every industry is practically nowadays. I mean, have you watched TV lately and you see all the commercials for these drug companies? It's it's, it's absurd, right? It's, you know, we live in this economy that is just dysfunctional in so many ways. The fact well, that because the you're listen, in Brooklyn for a long time, there was no co broking. And you know what the, that does? A disservice to the consumer. What you're saying is right about that. The United States of America are commissions. It is not a cartel. I'm just telling you, it is not a cartel. Can you answer this question for me? Yes. Why are the commissions in the United States two to three times higher than the rest of the industrial? Listen, all. Okay, so that's an interesting point the attorney makes. Why are the transaction costs? two to three times, it's not transaction cost, but the commission cost, the brokerage cost, two to three times higher in the United States than it is everywhere else in the world, right? And he's got a good point there. Now, the answer, and see, remember, you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. You can't evaluate what you don't see. And what you don't see is that around the world where they don't have a cooperative system like we do in the US, where they aren't using a multiple listing service, what you don't see is that people aren't getting as much choice. And it is hard, so hard to look for properties in these other markets around the world. The US system is way better. It's dramatically better. Having a cooperative system is a good thing, but we need to change it. And I think this lawsuit probably will change it to where the buyer's commission is paid by the buyer and the buyer's agent is not going to work for a buyer anymore without getting a contract from the buyer and making sure that they're going to get paid. And guess what? The consumer is going to benefit from that because now they're going to dedicate a lot more effort now, when a buyer's agent is working with a client, you know, they don't know that the buyer's really going to buy from them. The buyer might like go off in some other direction, buy from somebody else. You know, they'll sell you out in a minute. This is why you don't want to work with buyers if you're an agent, right? Because the buyers are so disloyal. That's one of the big things that has to happen. But the problem is that since the cost of the buyer's agent is built into the financing because it's paid by the seller, the whole lending business needs to change. I bet you're going to see changes in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all the big players out there in the mortgage market where they're going to now have a provision where they're willing to finance in the buyer's commission. It's going to be interesting. All commissions are negotiable. Own, you can negotiate own? them at any time. There's yeah, nothing written in stone. The, the, the jury right. heard videotape evidence that they negotiate from 6%, but they only go up. Yeah, that's not true either. Okay, so anyway, both sides are telling you a story there. <laughs> okay, so here's what happened with stock prices. Now, Remax settled out of this case for $56 million a little over a, little, a week or two ago. And I thought they overpaid, but they're looking like geniuses now. Okay, because look at Remax. Their stock was not hit like everything everybody else's. Look at everybody else. Here's Redfin. Oh my God. I mean, when that verdict came out, their stock just went through the floor. But actually, I think Redfin's actually pretty well positioned because they're in essence a platform. Okay. And they're a discount brokerage. So I think actually Redfin's going to pull through this pretty well. And their stock already did bounce back up today. Okay. So here's a story about here's why Zillow, Redfin, and other real estate stocks tanked after the jury ruling. Recent rulings could hurt the buyer agent business after fee conventions. Okay. But Zillow also, I think, is going to fare pretty well through this. Now, their business has to change quite a bit because what do they do now? They basically sell leads to agents, right? That's their, their big revenue stream. But because they're in essence a platform, and I argue that Redfin in essence is a platform too, I think the platform companies, the tech companies are actually going to do pretty well through this. I think companies like Compass 
are going to suffer a lot. I think we could see EXP and the other companies that were now named in all those other lawsuits, they could suffer a lot, but we'll see. Here's Zillow. Zillow got really hurt, but I think Zillow ultimately is going to do pretty well. And remember, I'm going to tell you at the end, the big disruptive thing, the big, big thing, it's coming. Okay, hang on a second. Here's CoStar. This is a player you probably don't hear much about. CoStar has always been a player in the commercial real estate industry, but they've been getting into residential. And Homes.com is now the second most trafficked residential marketplace in the United States. So CoStar is a beneficiary of this, right? And they're probably going to do really well. Okay, so we'll see. Now, let's talk about one of the biggest cartels in the world. Since we had a lawyer on and he gave his speech, I'm going to tell you, I have a lot of experience with the legal system. Okay, you know, I had that big lawsuit I won with his competitor. I had another big win just the other day. You know, you win some, you lose some, right? You know, my litigation side of my career has done pretty, pretty well for me, right? And, you know, this is usually competitive issues and competitors cheating us and you know we, we got to fight them look I, I mean my view of this is you have to spend money and time on these things because if you allow someone to take advantage of you you're basically allowing them to take advantage of all the people that come after you so you got to fight the good fight folks and you know i've got the money to do that i've got the knowledge and the experience to do that and i just think it's important to contribute to the collective good by fighting the good fight and holding these bad apples accountable and that's objective not subjectively right but here What's interesting, and I got this off of uh, Daryl Davis's uh, YouTube video, the American Bar Association, right? The attorneys right on their website, they're essentially, I would say, price fixing. I mean, you read it yourself. They, they give an example of contingent fee arrangements, okay? And certainly this lawyer on the big case has got a contingency, right? But so many others do. And here's the example. In a contingent fee arrangement, the lawyer agrees to accept a fixed percentage, often one third to 40%. Now I will bet you, if anybody can find this, I'll bet you a hundred dollars, okay? The first person comes back, listen, First person comes back, I'll give them $500, okay? I'll bet you $500. You cannot find something like this on the National Association of Realtors website. Find something like this on the NAR website that says, well, you gotta pay 6% commission. Yeah, I mean, this is like ridiculous, but right here on the American Bar Association website, the example they use is often one third to 40% of the recovery, which is the amount finally paid to the client if you win the case, right? That's what the lawyers get. Here is the New York State Bar Association, same thing. The ordinary, I mean, this is even worse language. The ordinary percentage is 33%, but it can be less. Oh, you mean that's actually negotiable? It's not fixed by law? Look at these scummy attorneys that do this, right? This is, this is their bar association. Why aren't they getting sued, right? In a contingent or sliding scale, as something like 50% of the first 10,000 recovered and 33% of the next 40,000 and 20% of everything over $50,000, right? So, I, I mean, talk about a cartel. Let me tell you, having been through it, the legal industry, that is a cartel. Okay, let's go on here. So let's talk about antitrust laws for a moment. The Sherman Antitrust Act, okay? This is what, over a hundred years old, I believe? You might remember this from school. Prohibits unreasonable restraints of trade, including price fixing, market division, and bid rigging. Violations, severe penalties, and prison time, okay? Now, folks, another area of the law that's gotta change. Corporations need to be able to go to prison. If they have all the rights of individuals, look at the 14th Amendment, okay? If they have all the rights of people, then they should be able to go to prison just like people. Why aren't those corporate executives at another cartel, Goldman Sachs or Wall Street in general, why aren't they going to prison, right? You know, all they do is they get fined, they pay a fine as part of their business plan, and that fine is essentially paid by their shareholders and their stakeholders. 
you know, they're not paying out themselves. It's unbelievable, right? Okay, Federal Trade Commission Act bans unfair methods of competition and unfair deceptive acts or practices, right? All violations of the Sherman, uh, the Sherman Act also violate the FTC Act, which allows the FTC to bring cases, right, themselves, right? And the Clayton Act, okay? So there you go, that's a little thing. I looked up the definition of a cartel on Investopedia. A cartel is a collusion of independent businesses or organizations that collude to manipulate the price of a product or service. I just don't think you can really say NAR is a cartel. I would love to be able to say that. I have no love for NAR at all, but I have never seen or heard anything about them trying to like fix commissions or even like allude to that. Okay. Just never heard that. Okay. Cartels are often competitors in the same industry, and they seek to reduce competition by controlling pricing agreements with one another. Tactics used by cartels are reduction of supply. So certainly the OPEC cartel, we're all familiar with this. They specifically say we're going to reduce production of oil so we can pump the price up, right? Price fixing, collusive bidding, and market carving. I don't know what market carving is. Got to look that one up. Okay, so anyway, you know about that. Understanding a cartel, it has less command over an industry than a monopoly where a single group or company owns nearly all of the given products or services. Well, here, I think some of the most guilty players are the big tech companies. They are near monopolies, okay? Better than cartels, right? They have way, way too much power. Pros and cons, the pros of, of having a cartel provides monopoly-like power to its members. Savings for its members is achieved through economies of scale because, you know, they control the supply chains and they rig that too. They rig both ends of the spectrum. Uh, products and services sold at higher margins to maximize profit, but they discourage new entrants into the market. Big tech, Wall Street. Why do you think all these big tech companies are saying, hey, we want to be regulated. Please regulate us. You know, Mark Fuckerberg, right? That scumbag. Okay. He goes to Congress and says, I think we need to be regulated. And then Sam Altman, OpenAI, he goes to Congress and says, yeah, you need to regulate this. Always the market leaders want to be regulated because they can afford the cost of compliance, whereas the new entrants can't afford the cost of compliance. So they're essentially building a moat around their business, a monopoly, right? Absolutely disgusting and ridiculous. These people should be prosecuted for that. Okay, lack of competition leads to price fixing and lack of innovation. It impacts consumers as prices for products and services are higher. The real estate industry is a very dysfunctional industry. And what needs to happen, in my opinion, is the barrier to entry needs to be raised, it needs to be a higher barrier to entry. Governments could require more education. It could require people to just be better, to really comply with ethics. There could be more enforcement. You know, all of these things could happen. But another more libertarian way to do it than that because I'm more of a free market guy, I'm not super into government regulation, is actually to see commissions drop. And if commissions drop, just like having less welfare offered would lessen the interest of people coming over the border, right? Then you would see fewer people interested in getting into these highly lucrative, insanely lucrative businesses where you can make, you know, like these giant fortunes because the commissions are so high, right? The reward is so high. Then you'd have fewer agents in the industry and they would spend less time and less money on marketing. They would do a higher number of transactions each and the consumers would be better served all the way around. Your realtor should be an expert technician. They should be good at their trade rather than good at marketing, right? That would be a more functional industry and they would not be spending so much on marketing time and money. 1.5 million realtors, four to 6 million transactions. You see the problem there, not enough transactions to go around. So 
I think this case will probably head this or a similar case will head to the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the land, and the buyer agent fees will have to be paid by the buyer, but the financing will change so they'll be financed in. I think the US system with this cooperation is far better than other systems in other countries that don't have the cooperation, but obviously there are some flaws with it that i've already talked about now here's the big disruptor folks this is the game changer okay you ready this is the game changer what if companies like lyft and uber are able to get lockbox keys see the real stranglehold on the monopoly is access to the multiple listing service and having a lockbox key that allows you to enter houses, right? Obviously, we don't want everybody to have a lockbox key because that would be pretty scary for all these people to have access to your house, right? But what if people who were already vetted and background checked, like drivers for rideshare companies, had lockbox keys? You as a consumer could simply go to Zillow or Redfin or homes.com or whatever website, whatever platform, and you could see what properties are available. And you could then summon a car to take you to the property where someone would escort you into the property and they would have a lockbox key to access that property. That would be a hugely disruptive thing. It would be an absolute game changer. And what if you could just pay a buyer's agent by the hour? That would make the cost a lot lower, probably. And it would balance the concept, the dynamics of the market out. Because right now what you have is you have this sunk cost problem where a buyer's agent who is working with you as a buyer in the traditional real estate business has taken you out, driven you around, showed you so many homes, you have the incentive to keep using up their time and they have the incentive to stop you from using up their time because they're gonna get paid the same either way. And they just get tired. And then they think, well, you know, maybe you're not gonna buy from me, maybe I'll just dedicate less effort to this. It would be better if buyer's agents were paid by the hour or paid by the showing or something like that. And there are some people trying to do this, but it really hasn't happened yet. But if rideshare companies get lockbox keys and you have access to the data directly as a consumer, that is an absolute tectonic shift in the tectonic plates of the industry. That would change everything. You'd still need to consult with someone because every house is so much different and, you know, analyzing the seller's psychology and having someone else to follow up on the deal without appearing anxious. Those are real benefits that brokers offer. It's complicated like anything. And we'll see how this all plays out. I'll keep you informed on future episodes. If you need help with your investment properties, of course, go to jasonhartman.com. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure you check out the YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube or another video platform, make sure you check out the podcast, The Creating Wealth Show, and our other great podcast. Just type Jason Hartman in any platform. And until next time, happy investing.